All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ARCS National Center on Criminal Justice and Disabilities final webinar in our 2017 Policing and People with Disabilities series, A Call for Procedural Justice. My name is Ariel Sims, and I'm the Criminal Justice Fellow here at NCCJD. Before we begin our presentation, I'm going to cover a few basics, um, including logistics and some things about WebEx in case some of you are new to this platform. So all participants are in listen-only mode. If you're having any technology issues during the webinar, please call the WebEx help desk number um, at the number shown on the slide there. It's also in the chat box. If you'd like to access live captioning, just copy and paste the link I provided in the slide and in the chat box into a separate browser window. Today's webinar is going to start with a series of speakers, and after we hear from everybody, we're going to have some uh, panel-based discussion about some different scenarios and things, and then we'll finish the webinar with some time for questions at the very end from our participants. You can post your questions for the panelists um, in the Q&A section on WebEx over on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also email questions to us afterward at nccjdinfo at thearc.org uh, in case we don't get to your question at the end. Please note this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website and nccjd's YouTube channel along with a copy of the slides and a transcript about a week from today. And a quick note on language. So NCCJD, we have a preference to use people first language and other language commonly used within the disability community. Uh, but many of our presenters today are coming to us outside of the disability community. So you might hear some language um, that we wouldn't normally hear in the disability community. And then one last uh, logistical request. A short survey is going to pop up after the webinar has ended. And if you could just take five minutes to complete it, it would really help us out. Make sure that we're bringing you the best webinars and the best speakers that we possibly can. And this webinar is funded by the United States Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Leanne Davis, uh, the director of the center, who will tell you a little bit more about us and why we're here today. All right, thanks, Ariel. And welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little background on the ARCS National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability for those of you who may be new to the uh, webinar today. So we were created back in uh, 2013, as Ariel said, funded through a grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And our focus is really to provide support and advocate at the intersection of criminal justice reform and also the rights of people with disabilities. So what's unique and exciting about the center is that we've been able to bring together both the issues of crime victims with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as those who are suspects, offenders, and defendants in the system. So the goal of the center is really to build the capacity of the criminal justice system, and that includes law enforcement, uh, victim service providers, attorneys, all of those who are sort of under that umbrella of criminal justice systems to respond to those very gaping often gaps that are already in the system when it comes to serving people with these types of disabilities. And so what our center has been focusing on is creating training uh, for um, many different folks in the criminal justice system, as well as providing technical assistance um, trying to get as many resources as we can on our website, which um, are also categorized based on type of professional who's look, looking for that information, and then um, creating publications and just generally providing better education around this topic. I just wanted to give you a little history of the series of webinars that we've been doing on this topic so far. And actually, before, before this year, we've created a number of different webinars on topics ranging from victims' issues to um, those who are suspects of sexual offenses uh, to competency issues in the system. And all of those are available on our website and free that you can go and look at. And uh, for this past uh, year, what we've been looking at is this policing and people with disabilities series. So originally in January, we, we started out focusing on the problem and we, we looked at intersectionality issues and wanted to delve more deeply into that. 
And then on May 18th, our next webinar really highlighted what are some of the solutions that we can look at and promising practices from within the country. And then today, our focus is more on the procedural justice aspect of this and how do we apply procedural justice principles specifically to how law enforcement can interact with people with intellectual developmental disabilities. And I did want to mention some resources on that that you can go to and um, get more information on. We had uh, a publication called Impact that came out um, from the University of uh, Minnesota that has a, a large number of issues related to criminal justice and people with IDD. And in that, we had an article on supporting procedural justice for people with intellectual disabilities in there. And that's a, a copy that you can get a free copy of this uh, if you go to their website. And um, it's just a great overview of the issues, but also focuses in on procedural justice specifically. And Ariel Sims, who you just heard from, she also uh, did an article for IACP's Police Chief Magazine a few months ago. And we can provide you more specific information on how to get a hold of these resources if you're interested in seeing those. Uh, I also wanted to mention that all of this information that we've been gathering through this process of conducting webinars on this issue, and really since the center started, we're putting that into a white paper looking at um, law enforcement issues, policing around people with IDB, everything from school resource officers to once a person is in prison and has disabilities, what kind of accommodations do they need? So it's a very broad um, uh, white paper that will allow us to look more deeply into specific subcategories on, in these issues. And I just wanted to let you know that that will be coming out uh, next month. We're looking at mid-October to the end of October. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware of that and we'll be looking for that. It will be available on our website as well as we'll send it out to everyone who has signed up for um, MCCJD's mailing list. And a quick thank you to our uh, co-presenters today. I just want to give a shout out to all of you who uh, have taken the time to be with us today and the time to prepare for this webinar. Um, I actually live in Arlington, Texas, working from a home office here. So um, both Lieutenant Daniels and Lieutenant McGuire are here in my local police department. So I really wanna thank you both for taking the time to do this today. Um, we're very lucky here that we have a chief of police, Chief Will Johnson, who um, focuses quite a bit within his police department on procedural justice. And so uh, we've been working with them locally around um, people with intellectual developmental disabilities, uh, just to see what is it that we can do better when it comes to not only applying procedural justice to this topic, but also just generally providing quality training. So I wanna thank you, um, Chief Davis as well, because of your background and experience in this and just allowing us to be a part of hearing all of your knowledge today. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Ariel to provide introductions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Leanne. And I just wanna echo the thank you to all of our panelists who are joining us here today. Um, you really make this webinar possible and we're really looking forward to having a conversation with you about this important topic. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Lieutenant Leo Daniel. Lieutenant Daniels has been with the Arlington Police Department in Arlington, Texas for 16 years. He has served in leadership roles on patrol at the APD Training Academy, the Special Events Unit, and in personnel and recruiting. He holds a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Texas at Arlington, a Bachelor's of Science from Hampton University, and has attended the Texas Law Enforcement Management Institute's Leadership Command College. Lieutenant Daniels also serves as a U.S. Department of Justice COPS Office Trainer of Procedural Justice and a National Institute of Justice Lead Scholar. And Lieutenant Daniels can only join us today till about 1.45 Eastern, but, but we are so glad that he's here and he's gonna talk us through some of the basic tenets of procedural justice. So with that, Lieutenant Daniels, I'm gonna turn things over to you. So go ahead and unmute yourself and then you can just turn your camera back on. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Ariel and Leanne. Um, 
what I'm going to be doing is just taking about um, 10 to 15 minutes to talk about uh, procedural justice. I understand that this is going to be how it is applied to some other areas outside of law enforcement, but just to give a background on procedural justice in law enforcement. As Leanne said, this is something that has been a part of the Arlington Police Department for many years now. We've seen how it can be applied to not only just traditional um, law enforcement, but to our community services, to our um, disabled community, to our, our community with autism. So we know this is something that can be applied. Um, so let me jump right in and just give you a little bit of an introduction to procedural justice. Okay, what is procedural justice? Um, procedural justice began um, as a concept by um, psychologist Dr. Um, Tom Tyler, probably back in the um, late 80s, early 90s. Um, what he was really looking at was trying to figure out a way to look at the way that disputes were handled in the court system. And what he realized is the way that people evaluated um, how they felt about their experience with what was going on in the courts was not necessarily by the outcome only, um, but more how they were treated in that process. Um, what developed as more of a just kind of a looking at from the psychologist standpoint, then how it was applied into the courts, which it followed, how does it apply in law enforcement, which was the concept of procedural justice. Um, and often um, looked at um, text of his is why do people obey the law? That's something that you may look into. It was um, first printed in 1990, republished in 2006. So that is kind of a base, although academic um, study of procedural justice, but that is a, a beginning process. But now Tom Tyler um, kind of began that framework. A lot of agencies around the country have decided to really embrace procedural justice and it has really become um, something that all law enforcement is looking into. Um, just a general definition for procedural justice refers to the idea of fairness of the process that resolve disputes and allocate resources. Um, it's a concept that embraced from positive change, organizational change, and bolsters good relationships. As we mentioned, that so much of what we talk about with procedural justice is not just applied to any one area, but it really is a concept. It is a theory and a concept that can really impact everything that we're doing in law enforcement. As I mentioned, um, it can be done in business. It can be done in, in, in all aspects of life. There will be um, around the country different pillars of procedural justice, different ways of looking at procedural justice, but they all come down to four pretty basic um, pillars. We're going to talk about fairness, voice, transparency, and impartiality. Different people will have different words for one of those pillars, but they'll all mean the same. We begin with the idea of fairness. So pillar one, fairness and consistency of rule application. What this really is getting into is that not only do people perceive that their situation was fair, but that there was a consistency of rule application to all aspects of it. So this is something that, of course, um, people can identify that if, uh, for different minority groups or different under, underrepresented groups. And as we're going to talk about later, when we start talking about um, individuals with disabilities or other areas that may question whether all rules are applied fairly. Um, this has to be a, a mainstream um, approach to anything, that everyone believes that the same rules of fairness apply to everyone who's involved. Next is the, the idea of voice and representation in a process. Um, what happens when we have people, and people have historically shown this, and, and studies support this, that very often, just like ideas of fairness, what impacts the way that people um, look at their experiences are not just about the fact that they had the experience, but did they have a voice in the process? Did they, were they able to share what was going on with them? Anecdotally, we hear stories all the time of people saying that they were okay with an outcome, but um, if they had an opportunity to share their voice or talk about why they believed what they believed, if they felt like they were really listened to, um, it's not just an opportunity to speak, but that they were heard and that they were listened to. Um, in law enforcement, the way we look at that as an example is if um, we have a promotional process and if people feel like they may not, or even better yet, if there's a opportunity in a job, if they didn't get a job, but if they talked about it, if they had an opportunity to speak to someone who didn't get that job, and if they had an idea of why, uh, what the representation was, and if they had any way to involve themselves in that process, it made them feel better about the outcome. 
Um, and again, as we're saying with all pillars, these are things that are applied to all aspects of life. This was just one in law enforcement. Next, the transparency and openness of a process. Again, transparency is extremely important in anything that we're dealing with in life. People need to understand that there are going to be things that they may not understand, they may not necessarily agree with, but they feel better about that process if there's some transparency in how those decisions were made, how those policies were developed in the first place. Um, there has to be a willingness of an organization to be open. We understand in law enforcement, we have not always been as transparent and as open as we need to be, and which was why procedural justice is so important in law enforcement. We understand, again, that all decisions are not going to make everyone happy, but we have to commit to being as transparent as we possibly can and open to as, as much as we can to prevent things uh, for the perception um, that people are, that we're trying to keep things or hide things, or that there's some type of underlying motive for why we're doing the things we do. We are better departments, a better, um, really better organizations on a whole, a better field when we are more transparent, when we are involving our community more often and letting them know what's going on in the process. And finally, um, our last one is impartiality and unbiased decision making. We need to commit to that we are going to be looking at every situation impartially as an individual situation, that we approach that situation, we look at it for the merits of what's going on at that time, that we're not allowing things that are outside of that, that we're not allowing perhaps biases that we may have to impact the way that we approach every situation. Um, it requires a little bit more work, but it's, it's well worth it if it's going to improve the process. Um, we've seen in law enforcement that can make it a safer process, that that can make it safer for the next officer. Um, and the same way we have unbiased decision making, officers have a lot of discretion. They have a lot of responsibility upon them to make good decisions. And those decisions have to be impartial and unbiased or that they won't be trusted. Um, which will lead me to my last point um, about procedural justice. All four of the pillars and everything that we talk about in procedural justice is built to really get to the idea of legitimacy. Everything in legitimacy is around the view that police are entitled to exercise their authority. And everyone has this here, but what it means is that if we are doing things in the way that we're supposed to, if we are following the concept and the tenets of procedural justice, then the community will believe that um, even when they don't agree with us, but they will believe that we are legitimate in enforcing the laws that the community has given us the right to commit or to enforce. We don't want to be in situations where people don't feel like, well, if I don't have a legitimate law enforcement community, then why would I necessarily follow those laws? Um, it is a concept that is completely tied to everything that we do. We cannot do anything in the community without people perceiving and understanding that they have legitimate law enforcement agencies all around the country working with them. And so every day with procedural justice is an opportunity to prove our legitimacy. We have to have that legitimacy in order to maintain the social order, manage the conflicts and solve the problems in our communities. And as we're going to move forward, and we're talking about specifically with people with disabilities, one of the things that um, Ariel will talk about later is about how these biases can impact that. Legitimacy believes or legitimacy leads people to understand that even when officers are making mistakes, if they are doing things from a legitimate standpoint, if they are doing things following the tenets of procedural justice, then they will give you the benefit of the doubt and we can work together to make sure that even when we make mistakes, that how do we improve from those mistakes and how do we make sure that the community continues to evolve. Um, so at that point, to keep it to the 12 minutes like I um, promised, I will stop there and I will stay on to make sure that I can um, try to address some of the questions later. All right, thank you so much for that, Lieutenant Daniels. Um, so Chief Davis, you're gonna be up next and I will introduce you while you're kind of um, heading over to your other PowerPoint. Let me just give you presenter privileges here so you can do that. All right. And um, pull up your bio here. So, all right, so Chief Davis began his public service career in 1992 as a police officer, officer with the city of Minneapolis. During his 16-year career with the Minneapolis Police Department, Mike served as a sergeant, lieutenant, and sector commander. 
Chief Davis has led agency-wide initiatives that have improved the performance of the entire organization while working with the community to lower crime and improve, improve police legitimacy. Chief Davis currently serves as the Director of Public Safety for Northeastern University, a global research institution with an enrollment of over 35,000 students. He has been recognized nationally for his work as the recipient of the 2012 Gary P. Hayes Award uh, from the Police Executive Research uh, Forum. Along with his work as practitioner, Chief Davis is a police practice consultant for the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and is currently the strategic site liaison for the City of Detroit as part of the Violence Reduction Network. He has taught other practitioners, conducted workshops, and presented his philosophy and methodology on police-led community building across the United States. Davis is a two-time graduate of Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota, with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in organizational management. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to you, Chief Davis, thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts about procedural justice and uh, what I believe that it, the relevancy that it has to most any conversation by which we're talking about um, folks who have authority and, and folks that deal with people that have authority. So as you can see, hopefully by the title of my uh, few minutes here, we're talking about two things related to procedural justice. One is the op how do you operationalize it? Uh, and we start by understanding which is the second thing is the essence of engagement, which is what I believe procedural justice gives us a fundamental roadmap to be able to do. So uh, as the last presenter described in a granular way, but what I try to shift people to is the understanding exactly what we're talking about here at its core, right? So that's really gonna be the, the crux of my conversation with you guys today. So fundamentally, uh, when you're talking about delivering a service or the treatment of people, especially as an organization delivering service to a broader community, um, you, you have to embody the experience that you seek to create, right? And, and, that's, and that's the important thing, right? So what is the ethos or culture within your, your business or your service, or in this case, your police department? How do people relate to one another? Uh, how well do we bring manifest people's strengths their passions and their abilities, right, to serve the mission set, right? And that creates this sense of legitimacy, uh, they first must feel that essence within the walls of the police organization and really any organization that should be created in a way and orchestrated in a way where everyone can do their best work. We'll talk more about that. So as was, was discussed, the essence of the core tenets of procedural justice are, are really into two different categories, right? So it's the quality of decision-making and the quality of treatment. So if we're thinking about the quality of decision-making, it is giving people voice, right, when you interact with them. Right, so you could see why this applies to any scenario by which there's someone of authority and there's someone who is, uh, I would say, needs to submit to that authority. Right? Um, having voice uh, is, is really mission critical to giving someone the impression uh, or leaving them with the experience by which they feel this was a just encounter, right? If talking to your boss, if you have teenagers and you're a parent, you understand that, you know, uh, because I said so no longer works, right? You have to give them an actual explanation as to why the decisions you're making for your child, um, in that case, are decisions for his or her best interest. The same thing goes for an employee. The same thing goes for someone who depends on your level of authority and autonomy as a police officer to make the right decisions. You have to give them voice. You have to give them a sense of neutrality as well, right? That you're that that you're not you don't come into this conversation or this encounter with a strong bias or any bias for that matter. And then the second, I would say, major category of you know, kind of distilling down this notion of procedural justice into what it means at its core is the quality of treatment. And respect, you can see bolded here, it means respect for people and their rights uh, really means uh, at its core, you respect the essence of a human being. We'll talk more about what that means coming up here. 
and trustworthiness. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in terms of building trustworthiness uh, in all of our relationships, uh, which leads to, in my opinion, you know, the encounters you have on the street uh, or the encounters you create on the street if you were a police leader, um, ones that really, I would say, you know, engender trust. So uh, one of the things I think is important to talk about here, especially when we're, we're bringing up folks that have disabilities or challenges, if you will, is this notion of intrinsic value. Um, at its core, procedural justice, uh, to fully embrace it or effectively implement it requires, right, that you believe that people have equal intrinsic value. Now, what do we mean, what do we mean by that? That means that you believe that everyone has an equal uh, ability, right, to contribute to society, regardless of their physical limitations or intellectual limitations, that they bring things that are uniquely theirs, and that by bringing those things into the conversation, by bringing those things into the world, by revealing the world, uh, revealing them to the world, right, that that is where we are at our most harmonious and most effective as a society. We, we have to believe that because as police, that's our job, right? We're in the human behavior business. We deal with people at their worst, but we also get the opportunity to see people at their best. And so how do we approach this work? We've got to believe that everyone is a person of value to society, not just as a human being, but have, they have potential to contribute. And through the interactions with us, they should feel in a better position to do that. It may sound a little bit aspirational, but anyone who reflects on their career in this, in this field of policing, after many, many years, will reflect on the experiences they had commensurate with what I just described. They don't, they don't reflect on the arrests or, you know, boy, I'm glad I caught that individual. who does that. They, they reflect on the ability they have to, to lift people up, for lack of a better term, right, and put them in a position by which they can serve others. All right, so follow me here. So when you're talking about inside the organization, inculcating these tenants inside the organization, one of the things we need to talk about uh, is language. I guarantee you that whatever organization you work for, the language prescribes the culture. If you're speaking things, speaking about things in a pejorative way, in a negative way, in a cynical way, that becomes your culture, right? When you talk, you are thinking aloud, right? So what you think and how that manifests itself into language, and in this case, collective language, determines how you operate. So it's very important that folks understand this notion of language matters and the words we use inside the organization matters. Now, I think one of the limitations have been to organizational development has been we've limited the addressing of language to changing of mission statements, say, or, or changing of a, of a value statement that you place on a wall. It's not that. It's the language that's spoken So words matter, We're trying to change an organization to get people to behave differently. We're talking about treatment, obviously, right? People have to believe within the organization that they're treated fairly, that they have voice, that you are neutral, that you respect them, and that you're, you're engaging them in a way that builds trust, right? Going back to the, the way in which we want people to engage folks outside the organization, they must feel that inside the organization. And you've got to pay attention to it and their grievances matter, however small they might be, right? It is about creating an experience by which every single interaction is one of high quality inside the organization, every conversation matters. There's those micro conversations that lead to the broader, I would say, efficacy of communication within the organization and changes the language over time. This stuff is very cyclical in that way. And lastly, celebration. So for police organizations, I can say this fundamentally, uh, it's fundamentally true across the board. You are what you celebrate. If the only thing you celebrate is the arrest of individuals or you celebrate, you know, the critical incident and the bravery of officers, those things are certainly worth celebrating at times, but they can't be all that you celebrate. You've got you to celebrate folks um, in a way that, that brings to the center this notion that we are uh, an entity that is looking to fundamentally make the community better by treating individuals with high degrees uh, of, of quality treatment, looking to bring their, their strengths and their capacities and passions into the center to improve the conditions of the community. 
And so what we're talking about here is police effectiveness. This is not something that's ancillary to policing. It is fundamental for us being effective as who we are as police practice uh, police practitioners. So what this all leads to, you can see this diagram. You so you have intrinsic value at the top, you have creative experience at the bottom, and then when you kind of uh, disassemble the center of what it means to go from a belief of intrinsic value to a creative experience, it is language treatment and how you celebrate these encounters. Um, you're talking about a creative experience. The question is, with inside an organization, when you leave, how do people describe the impact you made to the organization? what people say in the halls, right? It's not about being popular, right, for the sake of popularity. It's about being someone who added value to the experiences of people within inside the organization. I can tell you that organizations that have a absence of that or low levels of that have low levels of efficacy or effectiveness as an organization writ large, but in particular, police organizations. So, Talk about engineering trust. I mentioned trustworthiness is one of the you know, core attributes, core tenets of procedural justice. Trust is something that is uh, cyclically created and it's something that you know, obviously is comprised by, you see, by the, of three parts, right? We're talking about competency. I have to trust that you know what you're doing. I gotta trust that you are competent in your role. We trust that the airline pilot is competent, right? Um, and people trust that police officers are competent. Reliability. Um, I got to be able to count on you to do what you say you're going to do, right? If, if you're confident but you're not reliable, you're not, you're not going to, you know, embolden a sense of trust with me. And last thing is sincerity, which is often the hardest thing to convey, but the most important, right? If I'm trying, if I'm looking to give you voice in a conversation, how, how sincere am I in my effort, in my intonation, in the language that I use to describe this experience? Um, it becomes the essence of the communication. You can rely on me. I'm trustworthy in that way. I'm competent, but am I sincere? A couple of questions to ask yourself inside the organization if you're looking to make a fundamental change like this or increase the level by which people in, in, engage folks with high levels of procedural just uh, approaches. Um, the making and keeping of promises. And if this is something that doesn't happen, would you, you know, to a high percentage within your organization, that's a problem. So. Um, and then the expression of genuine interest and concern. Uh, the most thoughtful thing you can do to someone, right, in any kind of communication, is show genuine interest. Right. One of the common idiosyncrasies of kind of today's vernacular of communication is how you do it. Right. But then we kind of we do it as we're walking by them. So. So if someone says, I'm not doing well, um, now all of a sudden it's a burden to stop and, okay, now all, all of a sudden it gets awkward, right, because we're not used to diving deeper into that, right? But showing interest means what is interesting you now, right? What's on your mind now? What drives you, right? What's important to you? If someone's expressing what's important to them and you show interest in that, that is an act of kindness, right? And it, and it, and it expresses a level of sincerity. So if that happens within the organization, uh, I can guarantee you that folks, when they encounter folks outside the organization, are going to seek that understanding, which is at the essence of really, you know, creating these high-quality contacts, is really seeking understanding. And, and that can be uh, in any scenario, but it's particularly important if someone has a developmental disability. So um, we need to understand more so we know how to serve. So what, is, what does this approach create within the organization? So this is an illustration of what happens inside my organization. Um, we have many partnerships you know, within the university construct that enable us to be successful, right? And the idea here is that you're continually building partnerships in a way that creates something that didn't exist before. That's what a partnership is. So you can see what this illustration shows us is you know, we have these existing existing strengths that may exist separate from one another. But when those things link up, we create something that doesn't exist before. 
when you create an environment inside an organization, and thus hopefully in a community by which we are looking to leverage individual strengths, talents to solve problems or change conditions. What that means is you're creating something that didn't exist before, either inside the police organization to increase the level of efficacy or outside of the police organization and community to change or challenge the conditions to contribute to crime and disorder. The idea is through treatment, right, through looking at the tenets of procedural justice and by increasing, I would say, the quality of the conversation by paying particular attention to language, that you begin to build these robust partnerships in a way that sprout new ideas that otherwise would not have come to be, right? And that's an important thing, in my opinion. So the dimensions of this approach, you know, the idea here is that we're building a culture where everyone can do their best work, right? If you're doing that, You've got to pay attention to, to language. You've got to pay attention to the, the percentage of trust, right, within your organization, if you can um, measure it in that way, which I believe you can. Um, and you've got to pay attention to, obviously, the, the strength of your relationships and, and are you leveraging folks to the degree by which they're capable of providing uh, their level of service, right? So the dimensions of this is this, no, this notion of communal ownership. What we believe in the two organizations that I've led as chief of police is that we have a net-centric way of doing business, right, as looking at the illustration to the left. The idea is, is that um, we're, we're not hamstrung by this notion of hierarchical control. So we all have our roles, but those roles don't define us, and they don't define our interactions, and they don't define how, how we operate together. In other words, just because I have the rank, if you will, of chief of police doesn't mean that I know any better than you. In my organization, we all wear silver badges. Why is that? Because we're all equal. And in many cases, I would say uh, this notion of who's more important, I would say the officers on the street delivering the service are the most important element of the organization, not the chief of police. I'm not cause and they're not effect. Right? We are co-owners of this organization. And you owe it to this organization to contribute to the degree of what you're capable of. Activation of gifts, I've talked about that. If you develop this sense of communal ownership, we, we, we bring things to the center and we, and we generate new ideas with the activation of your gifts and talents. And the idea is that's the, that leads to a, a level of collective competency. And it's worth repeating, collective competency, right, which means new ideas are coming into fruition, and they're coming and you're creating a, a, a new experience for folks. And then you're leading to optimal efficacy. I fundamentally believe that organizations operate most effectively when people are, have a common sense of ownership, and people are, and through this notion that people are individually leveraged to do their best work, right? And that's where things like the notion of procedural justice take off. All right. If, if this if this if this soil, if you will, which is the culture of organization, does not exist, then you're like you know it's like putting seeds on on dry on dry soil that's not ready right to receive these seeds and have these things grow. Uh, we've seen it time and time again where organizations will get training in procedural justice, but you know the internal culture is so broken that it, it, it's just it's just it's not taken seriously. Right? So what are the results? I'm going to give you hard data here, right, so you can point at it. Or I can give you things that are, I believe are the most important. So what you're going to see are actual quotes of people who have delivered um, uh, to us, right, their impressions of our organization, right? So you can see that, you know, these are people from throughout the organization, our law enforcement partners. Um, students that, you know, exist in the, the 130 countries by which we exist across the world, um, the parents of students, right, the professor. Um, this is what, you know, in my mind, the, the results that matter exist within is, is these comments, right? And lastly, I consider you all my angels, right? So the idea is that we measure ourselves by people who take the time, right, to submit their comments. And, 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 and express to us the fact that they believe they've had a experience that's exceptional. So um, that to me is kind of a you know quick and real quick uh, 
kind of tutorial of how I believe you need to approach the work. Right? It's much more detailed than this, actually, at the end of the day. But the essence of it is treating people with that, you know, in a way that makes them believe they have equal intrinsic value, create a high trust environment, and focus exclusively on the work. So that's it. That's all I got. All right. Thank you so much, Chief Davis. I'm just going to get us back to our other PowerPoint here. All right, perfect. So up next, we're going to hear from Lieutenant Tarek McGuire. Lieutenant McGuire is a servant leader with over a decade of experience in public safety and leadership. Tarek earned his Bachelor's of Science degree in speech communication from Oklahoma State University and a Master's degree in Christian leadership from Criswell College. Tarek believes that America's greatest investment is in youth and created the Mentoring Arlington Youth Program in his community. Tarek has presented nationally on subjects concerning 21st century policing, improving community police relations, and leadership development. As a law enforcement executive for the Arlington, Texas Police Department, Tarek was assigned as a law enforcement fellow with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. He is a National Institute of Justice Scholar and Public Safety Consultant, working with nonprofit organizations and the Department of Justice COPS Office. He has received the L. Anthony Sutton Civic Imagination Department of Justice Award for his work in improving community police relations and the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for government leadership. And so with that, I'm going to turn things over to you, Lieutenant McGuire, and I will move your slide for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ariel uh, and Leanne, for the work that you do, uh, particularly to uh, vulnerable communities, vulnerable populations, people with intellectual disability. Uh, I'm truly honored uh, to uh, sit on a panel with some of our of the esteemed colleagues, Lieutenant Daniels uh, and Chief Douglas as well. Uh, thank you for your uh, comments on procedural justice. And hopefully, uh, I won't repeat uh, much of what you all have stated, but add to one of the premises of our conversation today. Uh, I just think that I've had a unique opportunity over the last year, as <clears throat> Ariel just kind of recognized, an opportunity to spend a year in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the International Association of Chiefs of Police at a pivotal time in our country uh, surrounding uh, law enforcement practices uh, and 21st century policing. And the reason why I say that it was a very pivotal time is because I believe that uh, the American public is rewriting uh, the social contract on uh, community police relations. Uh, we've seen a lot of activism over the past several years uh, concerning multiple issues uh, surrounding people uh, within our country. And I think one of those uh, pivotal moments for me was when I was able to sit on a panel uh, talking uh, on behalf of the ARC uh, and ICP uh, dealing with people uh, with intellectual disability. And uh, one of those difficult questions that I was asked was, was by a mother, uh, and I won't say her name, but she, she asked a very uh, crucial question. Uh, that I heard from, from many other uh, parents across the country. And that question was, is why did my child die or why did you have to kill my child? Uh, and it's a, it's a very complexing question. It's a very complexing position to be in. One, because uh, as a law enforcement officer, uh, you know, I wasn't the officer that was involved in that deadly force situation. Uh, the second thing is I don't know all the facts uh, that were possibly surrounding those situations. But uh, one thing that I did rely upon was my training and my understanding of the guiding police philosophy that the previous two gentlemen was talking about was procedural justice. Uh, no matter if I was involved in that situation or not, uh, I could definitely listen uh, and have empathy uh, and impartiality uh, and understand uh, the shoes uh, that that parent uh, was in. So. I think it's very important to, to understand that procedural justice is really a guiding philosophy uh, for not only law enforcement agencies, agencies, but for multiple other institutions. And so I think that we've seen throughout the course of history uh, where legislation has been very important to people uh, in general regarding civil rights. And I think that's the basis of our conversation. When we look at the history of the U.S. Constitution, 
when we talk about the 14th Amendment that talks about equal protection under the law, uh, and even in 1990 when the American Disabilities Act uh, was signed, uh, speaking of civil rights uh, and law that prohibits people uh, from discriminating against persons uh, that have disabilities. I think that we've kind of seen uh, through history uh, people that have continued to advocate uh, for legislation and for also people that have advocated for change uh, particular to uh, vulnerable population and vulnerable communities. And so as these gentlemen have stated, you know, Tom Tyler really just talked about uh, that people were more concerned with the process than the outcome. How do we treat people? Uh, we should not look at one person no different than the other, but we should treat people all all fair. So I just want to talk about a few things uh, about what law enforcement is currently doing, uh, what we've been doing over the last past several years concerning uh, people uh, that, that have intellectual disabilities or a person uh, that is in some type of mental crisis because we've seen time and time again videos or we've seen news articles that have caused an elevated concern on, on law enforcement response to uh, responding to persons uh, vulnerable population. Uh, so let's just talk about policy. I, I think that the chief kind of uh, outlined how uh, from top down command down leadership that it's important to exercise procedural justice. And he said another thing uh, that was uh, that really talked about in inclusiveness among the ranks. You'll never see uh, a police chief more than likely on the five o'clock news for being involved in office involved shooting. He'll more than likely respond on behalf of his police department. But I think it's so crucial uh, that when we talk about uh, what guides the police department and policy, uh, I think that every law enforcement agency should have some type of model policy that directs officers, directs personnel uh, how to respond to incidents when someone is in crisis or how to uh, identify uh, particulars of people uh, uh, or persons that are in our community so we can best serve them. So. The first thing I just want to kind of talk about is, is developing a model policy and what does a policy look like uh, from a law enforcement, enforcement perspective uh, responding to, to persons uh, that have some type of disability. I think the first thing that's important uh, is that the agency looks at what those best practices are in society uh, and also shape their policies around this. So an example, uh, a model policy should really address use of force. Uh, use of force really saying that uh, law enforcement should use the minimum amount of force to obtain lawful aggression. Not only that, but looking at how many officers respond uh, to a scene or an incident where a person is in some type of crisis or, or needs some type of help. Uh, and then not only that, but recognizing the signs and the symptoms uh, of a person that is in some type of crisis or that, that needs some type of help. Uh, the second thing I'd like to just talk about is of uh, the changes that we've seen in law enforcement since adv <clears throat> advocation has been really brought up uh, surrounding this topic. You know, normally we looked at uh, strictly use of force. We would look at an officer-involved shooting uh, as a series of incidents. Uh, we would also probably look at uh, use of force incidents by what the officer's actions were, uh, that they uh, use the right amount of force. But I think that there is a, a paradigm shift in how law enforcement leaders are thinking. Uh, no longer are they looking at these incidents strictly behind use of force, but now they're beginning to start to look at these incidents from a community health perspective. Are we truly uh, equipping our officers and preparing them from a training perspective to go out into the community uh, to best serve them, uh, not to just arrest a person uh, or, or lock them away or to put them in some type of facility, but are we truly looking at the tenets of, of that officer's response and, and really equipping them uh, through the training process and preparing them to deal with these situations as they uh, encounter persons or interact with persons out on the street. Uh, so just a couple of best practices uh, that I like to talk about from a preparedness standpoint that law enforcement is engaging in. Uh, I have to bring up uh, ICP. Uh, they have a campaign called the One Mind Campaign. Uh, and that One Mind Campaign has uh, three to four pillars in it, and it's a pledge that they're asking law enforcement organizations to do and be a part of. One of those uh, pledges is to uh, train 100% of your law enforcement agency, all sworn personnel uh, uh, in MHMR training. Uh, 
And then they're also asking uh, that law enforcement agents train 20 percent of their personnel in crisis intervention training. Uh, and then also to de develop a model policy, but not only develop that model policy, but also partner uh, with the institutions such as the ARC or someone of uh, MHMR uh, background in your community to help better prepare your officers uh, to respond to, to a crisis situation. Uh, then there are also uh, other organizations that uh, are having officers uh, respond with this particular special training in units and to do follow-up uh, uh, follow calls. And so an example of that that I was able to see on first hand uh, was at the San Antonio Police Department. They have a unit, particularly where they have officers who are not in uniform, uh, go to residents uh, and visit persons uh, that have any type of intellectual disability or, or any type of, uh, uh, I would say, dilapidated mental capacity uh, to where they can better serve them prior to the crisis. So we're taking really a more proactive response to what these situations are. And then within my own city that I'm working, uh, we have police officers that are assigned to each policing district that partners with the liaison from Tarrant County uh, who goes and visits uh, persons at their residence uh, pre-crisis and post-crisis uh, to try to get them to the tools and resources uh, that they need uh, uh, while they're out, you know, within our city. Uh, and so I think that those are, those are really, uh, uh, those are really remote, uh, I'm sorry, those are really key uh, moments when we can do those types of things because we, we begin to take labels off of people and we begin to humanize them uh, and recognize them as we should as citizens that are within our city. Uh, and then I'd just like to finally uh, just talk about just law enforcement training uh, uh, just kind of add to some things that I've stated. You know, normally we as police officers are taught uh, to get people attention. We're taught to give loud verbal commands. Uh, we're taught to, uh, you know, different techniques to restrain them. But I think that, you know, for an example, things that we've, that we've been able to learn in training is to change our perspective, change our concepts, the way we address people. So, for example, reality-based training uh, if a person has autism, it may not be best to walk up to that person to, if, if, if they're dealing with some type of situation or something that has required police response, or to go up to that person and yell at them. Uh, it may not be good to put lights into their faces because all of these are sensitivity, uh, since th these are sensitive situations and, and things that may incite them, but to talk to them in a calm voice, uh, to, to, you know, approach them in a different manner or to understand, uh, different behaviors, which we may see normally to be abnormal, which is normal for them, uh, allows us to be better, uh, and prepared to address these types of, uh, situations, uh, when someone is in crisis. And so finally, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, why, why is it important to adopt procedural justice as a philosophy? And, and why is it important uh, to really understand the tenets of, of, you know, what ICP has developed and not on that, the tenets of what 21st century policing, uh, the final task force report has identified. I think it was the Washington Post in 2015 and 2016, uh, identified that persons that had some type of mental or developmental disability, uh, 25% of officer involved shootings, fatal shootings. Uh, were in response to those situations. Uh, police officers are not clinicians, uh, but we absolutely need the help of those that have backgrounds uh, in special situations to better equip and partner with us uh, to give a better response. I think it's very important to realize that public safety is a co-production. It's not uh, singly done by the police, uh, but it's also uh, done by persons that are willing to partner with us to make our community safer. So I truly believe that this type of work, these type of conversations are a great value. And not only are they of great value, uh, but they also allow officers to, to better de-escalate situations. They also uh, decrease officer use of force. They also decrease officer-involved shootings. Uh, so I encourage you uh, to work with law enforcement as we continue to try to champion uh, these challenges that within our communities, because ultimately 
Uh, the goal is for the community to go home safe and for law enforcement to go home safe. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much, Lieutenant McGuire, and to our other speakers as well um, for laying that out. So, you know, we've kind of come to this place where we, we've kind of heard about procedural justice and the main tenets of that and how organizations can really start to implement that within their own agency. And, um, and then Lieutenant McGuire started to started our conversation on, on disability and how do we apply aspects of procedural justice when we're talking about law enforcement interactions with, with people with disabilities. Um, so we're going to get into that next, and I, I've been tasked with kind of tying this all together, and it's, it's a privilege and honor to try to do so. Uh, but first, I want to remind you that you can use the Q&A box um, on the right-hand side of your screen if you have questions for any of the panelists. Um, so go ahead and start kind of posting those there. Um, and then after, after this presentation and after we have a little bit of discussion among the panelists, we will start going through your questions. But feel free to start posting those now. Okay, so, you know, Leanne mentioned earlier that this is really an intersectional issue and topic. Um, we're going to focus on disability today, but we know that this is a broader issue and there are many communities and, and people with many identities who are impacted by law enforcement interactions and how they interact with the community. Um, but we're going to focus in on disability today. And not everyone on the webinar will have a good understanding of what disability is or, or what it could mean to different communities. So I'm going to briefly touch on that for, for those of us who are on, um, who may be new to the disability community. Then I want to kind of situate uh, disability within the larger context of policing and really start to understand why we have certain misconceptions about people with disabilities in policing and how that can affect um, behavior of law enforcement officers and interactions and you know, affect and cause things like stereotypes and bias within, within officers and others in the community. And then from the disability perspective, we want to provide some recommendations to the law enforcement community about ways that we see um, could help improve interactions with, with people with disabilities. Um, so that's what we'll try to really get into for the last piece of this. So let's talk about um, how we define disability. Uh, disability it's not a static concept, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And you hear a lot of labels used in, in society at large and also in the disability community. You know, we have to remember that labels are, you know, as Chief Davis was saying earlier, our language is kind of limited, and we create labels um, to give ourselves shortcuts in how we talk about disability and those things. So we'll, we'll use some labels throughout the rest of the presentation, but just have to acknowledge that, um, that their shortcomings as labels. A couple of different models of disability that we can kind of refer to or use to define what this concept is. Uh, the first, the medical model, which comes to us from the Americans with Disabilities Act and is one of the most, I would say, common sort of understandings of disability, especially in the law enforcement community. And then kind of an, another piece of disability or the social model of disability, which comes to us from human rights, human rights law and also from people with disabilities themselves. And then there at the bottom of the slide, there's an image of a jar and it just says label jars, not people. Um, and I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that, you know, we're talking about people, we'll be using labels, but what we're really, what we're really about is people. So with that, a little bit more into each of these labels. So on the medical side, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act and other kind of official or legal definitions of disability tend to have kind of these three elements that you see here in these boxes. It's defined as an actual or perceived impairment that uh, two substantially limits and then three, a major life activity. And those are the three kind of components that we see. And really this model is saying that uh, there's an impairment, there's something wrong with the person and um, in society's view, whatever that is, it has to be fixed. Um, and that's kind of this idea that, that disabilities are medical conditions or, or something that needs to be cured or fixed. Um, and we can also think about this as, as a functional limitation model. So this is by far the dominant kind of conception outside of the disability community about what disability means. But there's another model that a lot of people who identify as having disabilities identify with this particular model of disability. 
So where the medical model, model says disability is something to be, to be fixed or cured or treated, uh, the social model says disability is just another piece of human diversity and something that should be really kind of celebrated as, as an aspect of diversity. And it's not just about somebody's impairment. Instead, it's about how that impairment interacts with different barriers created by society. And so we kind of get this idea that society has created things um, that actually create disability across our population. So just kind of a real quick example to kind of illustrate that, uh, there's an image on the PowerPoint of a staircase, and at the bottom of that staircase is a wheelchair. And so we can think about someone who uses a wheelchair to navigate the world. Um, and under the medical model, we'd say, well, the person has a disability because they have to use a wheelchair. They can't uh, walk on their own, walk independently without this device. Under the social model, we'd say, well, it's not just that the person uses a wheelchair. It's the fact that society has created things like stairs and curbs and uneven surfaces that make it really difficult for someone to navigate the world who uses a wheelchair. So under the social model, it's this combination of a perceived or an actual impairment with what society has done around the person that kind of can create this disability. And like I said, a lot of people with disabilities, especially developmental disabilities, which we'll get into, tend to identify with this model. You know, disability is part of who they are. It should be celebrated as a piece of, of who they are and as part of larger diversity. And that society has a really big role in creating um, creating barriers for people with, with different disabilities. And then the other kind of final piece that we get from this model of disability that, um, you know, the ARC uses quite frequently is people first language. So referring to people as you know, a person with a disability or people with disabilities or a person, um, a person with intellectual disability as opposed to an intellectually disabled person. Um, that really comes from this model and comes from people who identify um, as having disabilities and how we talk about it. So with that, um, because we're the ARC, we focus on intellectual and developmental disability. And we're going to talk a little bit more about developmental disabilities today. Of course, there's a whole range of disabilities and lots of categories and lots of labels out there. But we're really going to focus in on this. And, it's, and in addition to the reason being, you know, that we are, that I'm from the ARC, that Leanne is from the ARC, um, is that officers who are getting training right now on disability are getting training on psychiatric disabilities or mental health disabilities, more commonly known as mental illness. And we hear a lot less about developmental disabilities, so we wanted to just really make sure that we got this in here um, so we could really look at that issue um, more broadly about how law enforcement interacts with people with disabilities. So a, a definition here about developmental disabilities, any physical or mental impairment that starts during the developmental period, so early on in someone's life, before age 22 and has a tendency to last throughout the lifespan. And there has to be some kind of limitations in at least three, uh, at least three areas and there are kind of seven categories listed there. So self-care, uh, the ability to learn new things, perhaps um, a limitation in how you, how you function or move around the world, uh, self-direction, you know, your ability to kind of decide for yourself um, how, your, how your life uh, should go. Uh, whether you can live independently, uh, support yourself, and how you communicate and use language. So at least three of these things. Now, of course, this is a really kind of broad term and a broad category. And there are lots of labels that we associate with developmental disabilities, and you can see some on the slide here. So any of these could potentially be uh, considered a developmental disability. But again, it just depends on when did the disability start? Does it tend to continue across the lifespan? And does it impact at least three of those seven things that I mentioned? And so these are just some of the example labels. And, and the most probably common ones you'll hear, especially in the law enforcement context, are intellectual disability, uh, autism, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. These are the ones that are really starting to, um, to gain some traction and to really start to be noticed by the criminal justice community. But of course, we still have um, a ways to go on that. So now that we kind of know what disability is and, and what we're kind of talking about and 
it's important to also think about this from from a kind of a historical lens as well. So, you know, I don't think it would surprise anyone on this webinar to know that people with disabilities have faced a long history of discrimination um, in this country. And Lieutenant McGuire mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed in 1990 um, that helped helped address some of the civil rights issues that people with disabilities were facing. And at that time, uh, with a large focus on kind of physical accessibility to spaces and, and public places and those kinds of things. Um, but of course, you know, the history of, of the discrimination faced by people with disabilities has, has been very long, um, unfortunately. And in this country, back in the early 1900s, um, those of you who are joining us from the disability community, of course, will be familiar with the eugenics movement, um, which, was a, which, was, which was a social and kind of scientific movement at the time uh, that was designed. The idea was to kind of purify and improve the human race by uh, sterilizing people with disabilities so that they couldn't reproduce and keep bringing people with disabilities into the world. That was kind of the whole idea. And if this sounds familiar, um, it probably is, and actually led later on to some of the uh, same ideas cropping up in Nazi Germany and some of the experimentation and sterilization practices we saw happening there as well. Now, I don't mean to imply that bias against people with disabilities is, is only negative or could only be about devaluing who they are. Um, it can go the other way as well, and, and sometimes we see what the disability community refers to as tokenism um, or inspiration porn about people with disabilities. And what that basically means is that we're elevating people with disabilities and overvaluing them because of the disability and not because of who they are. And so we kind of see this on, on both sides. And you know, you might be wondering, well, how the heck do I know if I, if I carry biases for or against people with disabilities? And one way you can test that is the implicit association test, um, which was created from a, a group of academics at Harvard University through Project Implicit. And it's just a way that everyone can kind of check in about their own internal biases, their own implicit biases about uh, a bunch of different groups, not just folks with disabilities, um, towards racial minorities, uh, towards folks with different sexual orientation. There are a bunch of different categories you can test uh, yourself on. And so if you're curious about your own tendencies and how you think about people with disabilities, that's kind of one way to, to kind of see that. And if you just Google that test, it'll, it'll come up um, pretty quickly. So we know we have this long history of discrimination. And because of this long history, we've kind of learned as a society to carry these biases um, typically against people with disabilities, but sometimes, you know, that overvaluing also comes in. Um, and so what happens when we have this long history of discrimination and we have these biases, that can translate into how we behave and how we interact with people uh, with disabilities. And of course, you know, law enforcement officers are humans, so they will carry the same biases that a lot of people in society carry and hold. And these can also translate into certain misconceptions or stereotypes about disability. And these can manifest in policing in, in a few different ways. So I've kind of pulled out what I think are some of the top misconceptions about disability here um, in policing. But of course, I think there are others. But these are the really, probably the biggest ones that usually when, when myself and Leanne go out and train law enforcement officers on this topic that we have to really address. Um, so the first is that, you know, disability is this very rare Thing, you know, and, it, and it's so easy to see that officers really don't need any training um, about it because they'll know when they see a person with a disability. And of course, people kind of think about, you know, someone in a wheelchair or someone using a cane who has a visual impairment um, and, and think, you know, I'll know when I'm interacting with someone so I can adjust my behavior then. Uh, the second kind of misconception is that people with disabilities are more dangerous than other people in the population, and especially those disabilities that we think about as hidden. Um, so psychiatric disabilities, developmental disabilities, disabilities that are harder to see, we tend to associate those with danger. And then the last point there is that um, officers tend to have this conception that they're only going to encounter a person with a disability who's having a, a crisis. And we'll get into more about you know, what crisis means to the law enforcement community versus what it could mean to the disability community. And so they're not, officers aren't always on the lookout for folks with disabilities because they assume 
um, that there has to be a crisis in order for them to see it. So, you know, those are the misconceptions, but, you know, let's spend a few minutes kind of talking about, you know, the facts and what do we actually know. So we know that disability is not some rare, you know, hidden thing. Um, about 15 to 20 percent of people worldwide have a disability, and we all, in the United States, the statistic is usually reported as about one in five, which is a pretty significant number. Um, and we also know that most people with disabilities have what we would refer to as hidden or invisible disabilities. They're disabilities that are, are not so easily observable. You might not be able to, to see the disability upon encountering the person. Uh, we also know from research from the psychology community and others that you know, people with all kinds of disabilities are not more dangerous than other folks in the population, um, even psychiatric disabilities, and that's the one that usually gets the most um, the most stigma attached to it around this idea of dangerousness. Um, but when you look at this issue stringently through academic research, you know, that that starts to fall away and you realize that it's really more of a misconception and a stereotype. And then, of course, this idea that we are only going to encounter a person with a disability um, if they're in crisis. Well, we realize now, of course, that you can encounter folks with disabilities in a lot of different ways in the criminal justice system, especially. Um, one, because they have significantly higher rates of victimization. Uh, three to four more times more likely to be victims of a crime, especially for those uh, with intellectual disability, very high rates of, of victimization. Uh, significant overrepresentation in the population of people who are homeless. Over 40% have disabilities. And of course, we know people with disabilities are also disproportionately represented in prisons, jails, and every other piece of the criminal justice system. So, you know, the idea that law enforcement would only encounter someone with a disability in crisis out in the, in the community um, is false. It's certainly one way they could interact, but um, there are plenty of other ways that law enforcement should be prepared to recognize and react appropriately to someone with a disability. So kind of based on that, you know, the disability community has kind of put forth some recommendations generally, and, and, and I think there certainly is room for procedural justice principles and incorporating all of those into every aspect of law enforcement. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that could look like. Um, but we also have to go back to this idea of crisis and make sure we're, we're using that word um, in a way that computes to both the law enforcement community and the disability community, because usually those communities are not uh, speaking the same language. And then the final recommendation is that we have to meaningfully include people with disabilities in the larger disability community in these discussions and in law enforcement activities. And again, I'll get into that a little bit more. So that first recommendation about kind of incorporating procedural justice. So this is kind of how we would conceptualize how you would incorporate procedural justice into law enforcement relations with people with disabilities. So first and foremost, um, I think it's important that all officers are trained on disability. Um, so they have a good understanding of what it is and what it means and what it means to different people and also how to interact appropriately and with respect. And I think sometimes, you know, we see Respect can manifest itself differently for the disability community um, than for other communities. So it's really important to train officers specifically about that. And then, of course, we want to make sure, as Lieutenant McGuire was talking about, that we have these use of force policies in law enforcement agencies that take into consideration disability. And we do have some legal impetus behind that. You know, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have Title II of that act, which requires all public entities to kind of modify their practices to make sure they're not discriminating against folks with disabilities. So we can think about that here and, and the procedural justice principle of transparency and making sure those use of force policies are addressing disability, but also are accessible to the public and people know what those policies are. Uh, and of course, when use of force does occur against a member of the disability community, there has to be a, you know, a thorough investigation. And it would be better if that investigation was transparent so the community is aware and knows how that investigation is being conducted, um, you know, who was involved in that particular incident and why it happened. And importantly, how is the community going to prevent that from happening again? And then I think with all three of these things, you know, the idea is that you should be inviting members of the disability community 
um, into those processes, into training, into policy making, um, into reviewing policies, and into reviewing use of force incidents themselves. So I think that's kind of one way to conceptualize how we start bringing procedural justice in to addressing this issue of negative interactions between law enforcement and members of the disability community. That second recommendation, um, crisis prevention. So a couple of different things. You know, there's there's kind of this general conception that if we're talking about a crisis, we're talking about a person with a disability. And um, I don't think that's true. You know, people can encounter people in crisis uh, for a variety of reasons. So, um, you know, someone may have just lost a loved one and they might be having an, a strong emotional reaction, perhaps in a public place, that comes across as a crisis to people around them and then law enforcement might be called. That person doesn't necessarily have a disability, but they could still be experiencing what we would think of as, as a crisis. Um, second, as um, you know, Lieutenant McGuire and others were kind of hinting at, is that sometimes officers themselves can escalate a situation, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So Lieutenant McGuire, you know, gave an example of autism, and if officers come on the scene and are yelling and are using a lot of um, flashing lights um, or trying to touch the person, that that could really escalate a situation that otherwise couldn't, would not have been a crisis or would not have um, evolved into a crisis situation. And I think that that's really key in understanding how officers um, can play into creating crisis situations. And then the final thing is is language. Um, as Chief Davis was saying, you know, we use language, but different communities use different language differently. And so, you know, crisis could mean one thing to a law enforcement officer, but mean something else to the disability community. And so we have to be having those conversations together, you know, to understand are we really defining crisis in a way that makes sense um, and that really gives officers, you know, good structure and good training on how to respond while still respecting and interacting appropriately with people with disabilities. And so then the final recommendation I just wanted to touch on um, is inclusion and, and meaningful inclusion. So by this, I mean, you've got to include people with disabilities in everything that law enforcement agencies do. So this means um, including them in training efforts and there are some good things happening in this space. Um, uh, there are some really interesting things being done in Maryland right now where self-advocates, uh, people who identify as having disabilities, are being paid to be trainers alongside law enforcement trainers, uh, even as far back as the academy level. Um, so that's kind of one way to include them. Another way is to actually employ people with disabilities in our first responder agencies. Uh, so employ them as police officers, as firefighters, as EMS um, responders, all of those things, those are all, um, you know, ways that we could really bring the disability community into the law enforcement and first responder community at large. And it's, employment's a huge problem for the disability community and, and for people with intellectual and developmental disability, especially where the unemployment rate is about 85%. And so we could kind of, uh, you know, kill two birds with one stone if we start uh, creating jobs and, and creating spaces to bring the disability community into the law enforcement and first responder community. And then again, the last one I already touched on is that, you know, the disability community needs to be involved in all aspects of law enforcement kind of practice. Reviewing policies, um, when use of force happens, they can be involved in reviewing those incidents, perhaps through citizen review boards, those kinds of things. And they can help train law enforcement officers on disability um, as the experts themselves on disability. Um, so with that, I wanted to kind of uh, transition to a panel discussion, but first I just kind of wanted to open it up to all of our panelists who are, who are with us um, to just if they wanted to chime in or, or to comment on anything they've heard so far before we get into our panel discussion, just wanted to make sure that they had a space to do that. So panelists, I give you the floor if you have any uh, comments you'd like to make at this time. Okay, hearing none, so it sounds like we'll just jump right into the panel discussion. And, and thank you to those who are posting your questions. Um, we are definitely gonna get to those right after, after we have a little bit more discussion with our panel. So now that we've kind of heard from everybody and we've heard these different perspectives and we have a sense of 
what procedural justice is and what that might look like um, from the disability side of things, we kind of want to put all this together and look at some kind of realistic scenarios that, that are happening around the country and just have an open discussion with all of our panelists about how we can apply procedural justice to those um, scenarios. So we can kind of think about this um, a few different ways. So uh, one of the scenarios will be individual and the others are kind of more systemic or kind of broader in their approach. But we can think about these two different questions with each. So how could we apply procedural justice principles to the particular situation and hopefully achieve a better outcome? And then second, how could law enforcement respond differently um, given these scenarios using procedural justice principles. So that's kind of the goal and that's kind of the idea. Um, so with that, let's bring up the first scenario. So this is one, unfortunately, that's um, a little all too common and actually happened last week in Arizona. People might be aware of that. Um, so somebody with autism, say, is in a public place and maybe engaging in behavior that's typically associated uh, with the disability. Um, the incident in Arizona, there was a young gentleman who had a piece of string and um, was kind of rhythmically moving the string back and forth. Um, and of course, people in the disability community know this is called stimming or self-stimulation. It's very common for folks with autism. Um, an officer came on the scene and approached um, this young person with, with the string and um, thought, that the, thought that the young man was high on drugs or kind of was up to something um, not good. And what actually what happened was the officer then tried to um, restrain the person with autism, and of course, um, having sensory processing issues, the person with autism did not respond uh, particularly well to being touched, and um, the overstimulation was a very kind of scary and traumatic situation for him. So panelists, um, you know, this happens kind of frequently, and we saw it just happen last week. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on how could we take procedural justice principles and apply it to this kind of scenario? How could officers apply this to interactions with individuals? And I will open the floor. So uh, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. All right, so um, just a thought, you know, when it comes to, you know, these kind of scenarios. Um, one of the things to think about when it comes to um, getting the desired outcome is the setup. And, and the setup means, you know, how are we training our officers to engage folks writ large? Um, what are the, how are we training our officers to read the cues that maybe a, a situation is what we once thought it was? So if we come in and we're, we're you know, we've determined that, or we've made the preliminary, preliminary decision that this person is high on drugs, how do we reverse our, our, our actions, right, or, or, or draw tactically, a tactically sound way um, when we think something else might be going on? Uh, what are the tools and support to do that? What are the processes to be able to do that, you know, from a responding officer's perspective? Um, and then how do we share these stories uh, amongst the, the departments so that people can learn from these things? I think, you know, that is what we're talking about, right? So one of the things that I think is important, right? So if it, an officer has a successful encounter with someone who has autism, like in this case, or an unsuccessful one that could have been handled a little bit better, how do we share that story? Uh, so for me, you know, I think about, you know, through the lens of procedural justice, approaching this work in a way that, um, you know, increases the probability of success. So that means it's something that we talk about, right? It's, it's like a mental conditioning, if you will. Um, just like we have other, you know, areas by which we try to condition a response from our officers, this has to be conditioned as well. So just a few thoughts there. Yeah, and that's really helpful. So kind of to think about this from like a prevention standpoint and what can we do ahead of time to make sure these, these kind of situations aren't happening. Um, Lieutenant McGuire, did you have anything you wanted to add? Sure, I think uh, you know what the chief just stated was was absolutely right. Uh, you know, looking at that video, it's it's uh, difficult sometimes because I was in that situation. But I, I do think that uh, you know training is is very important uh, to recognize um, you know 
or identifying, uh, I guess, if you would say, different behaviors to, to help that officer assess and make his decisions. And, uh, you know, just a personal experience for me, I had gone through our training, uh, and there was, a, there was an example of, in the training, a video of a mother who had a child uh, that was uh, acting very violently, uh, and he had autism, and she was able to restrain her child. And I found myself in that same exact situation in a restaurant where there was a young man uh, who showed signs of autism, and he was banging on the table, making very loud noises. But as you as you advised earlier, that's that's natural behavior. Uh, and so based off of that training experience that I just had previously had inside of the classroom, I was able to assess that situation uh, and, and recognize it as being normal behavior and let that family uh, interact with their family members. Uh, so I think that these are uh, lessons learned. Unfortunately, sometimes mistakes are made uh, and we are able to uh, champion some of these moments from learning from those situations. So uh, just as the chief kind of acknowledged, uh, and just talking earlier about procedural justice in a uh, law enforcement organization, I think that these type of trainings uh, and out has to be a priority for the law enforcement organization. And as it, as it is a priority uh, for the organization, then I think we will see better outcomes because the officers are, are better trained on these issues. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's um, that's helpful, and, and it's so important to think about when we are encountering kind of behavior. You know, is it really criminal behavior, or is it behavior associated with the disability? And, and I think you're right. Sometimes um, it's hard for officers to recognize that uh, right away, and uh, to really understand kind of the difference when they're encountering it, for sure. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next scenario here which is a little more complicated and it's a little broader. So, you know, it's, it's fairly common that when a person with a disability is injured or killed in a confrontation with law enforcement, um, a grand jury or prosecutor doesn't necessarily indict the officer uh, or officers involved on criminal charges. And this sometimes leads to um, a lot of outcry and kind of upset in the general community. And so when we have this kind of situation happening and Again, you know, I don't want to talk about guilt or innocence here in regards to the officers, but what could the law enforcement agency do in response to an incident like this that would incorporate procedural justice principles? And I'll give the floor to either Lieutenant McGuire or Chief Davis. So, um, you know, this, this type of scenario is not just limited to uh, these type of, I mean, the, the, the issue of dealing with someone with disability, but it has to really do with how we approach any kind of controversial subject, uh, or I would say uh, contact. It really begins with uh, the, the work that's been done up front, and I, and I always, I stress that because, you know, if you're only reacting to tragedies once they occur, and you're not thinking about these things on a regular basis, you're not building uh, the, the level of capital within the community to be able to weather the storm here, trust capital, we call it. Um, then, then it's really, you've made, you've made things exponentially more difficult. But in, just in response to it, it's important to hold dialogues and let people, and give people the opportunity to express how they feel and, and try to find, I would say, the, the right forms by which to share information in a way that is productive. Right, so we all know that there are, you know, sometimes these things work, sometimes they don't work. Sometimes they go horribly, sometimes they don't go, sometimes they go better than others. But the idea in my mind is that there's a already a cadence of communication by which now you plug in said scenario. And then through that, you know, leveraging that cadence of communication, you're able to, you know, hopefully get some resolution because you've resolved issues in the past. So to me, that, that is the essence of this, is, is, is the sincerity part of, of the trust wheel that I brought up earlier, right? So you got to believe that we're a competent police organization. Um, you got to believe we're reliable in this competence. You got to believe we're sincere when we say, you know, we're doing everything we can to avoid these things happening in the future. Um, and if people, you know, the more that people understand and, and I accept that, the more successful you'll be as a police organization. 
Yeah, so kind of this idea that if you kind of build up your organization ahead of time and and really have um, that legitimacy with the community that it will help when things like this do happen. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And, and Tarek, I have a feeling that you might want to jump in here as well, um, especially about talking to family members after after something like this happens. Sure, just as the uh, chief commented on, on I, I believe that whatever relationship that a law enforcement organization has with the community uh, pre-crisis, uh, they will go into that situation uh, post-crisis with those same relationships. It's not a good time to try to develop relationships uh, when a crisis occurs, and the police department cannot assess or determine exactly uh, when that crisis will happen. And so that's why it's important for pre-existing relationships to occur. I think that this this uh, question brings up, or this scenario brings up a, a great question uh, surrounding transparency. Uh, I think it's important for the law enforcement organization to educate the community, uh, particular to uh, the, the standing laws, uh, whether whether it's uh, state legislation or whether it's uh, some type of law uh, surrounding the district attorney's office on release of information. Uh, when you talk about transparency, I think people want to see uh, is there any film that's related to that situation or that incident. Uh, they want to to visually see that uh, to, to bring some type of mental uh, confirmation to maybe what their thought process is. So I think it's very important to to center down what your risks are and to really focus in on uh, possibly that family uh, to communicate with that family, uh, thinking about procedural justice. Uh, to let that family know that regardless of what the situation was or regardless of what the outcome is, is that you empathize with them uh, because any loss of human life uh, is a loss to, to the community. It's a tragedy regardless. Uh, I always tell people that uh, when officers are involved uh, in any type of uh, uh, deadly force incident, uh, that, you know, out of being in law enforcement all, almost 15 years, I've never met a police officer that wakes up in the morning and says, today I want to go to work and I want to take someone's life. Uh, it's a tragic situation. Uh, situation is a, it's a, it takes seconds to make that, to make that decision. Uh, and so it's not an easy decision, uh, if that is the outcome. And so I would say that, you know, in today's time in society, if a mistake is made, it's important for that law enforcement agency to admit if the mistake was made, but it's also important for them to be as transparent and give updates as much as they can uh, in the process, whether it's with the family and also with the media. And I think it goes a long way uh, in looking at the community's health and officer safety uh, and your organization's safety and, and whatever the outcome may be. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, transparency, which is one of the main pillars, could be really key in, in these kinds of situations. and. And law enforcement agencies could be more transparent in when this happens and how they respond. And of course, making considerations for if, if somebody is being considered for criminal charges and potential evidence. But, you know, if there are no criminal charges, uh, releasing body camera footage, um, you know, you said admitting if there was a mistake made, um, you know, to the public and those kinds of things could uh, kind of really go a long way to kind of building up that, that community goodwill or repairing. Um, maybe the relationship with the community that was otherwise damaged. Right. So I've got one more scenario for you guys to think about. And this is this is the, the big one and something that you know several of us have alluded to, um, but really kind of want to dig into this a bit more. So, you know, we know that between a third to half the people killed by police are people with disabilities. Um, and, and Lieutenant McGuire, you mentioned earlier that, you know, we have some other statistics that about 25% at least are folks with psychiatric disabilities. And, you know, these numbers here are incorporating all kinds of disabilities um, and come to us from different <coughs> media studies and things like that. And so, you know, we have this uh, inclination and we have this understanding that a lot of this could be linked to implicit bias and how how officers may be responding to those implicitly held biases against people with disabilities. Of course, biases that are held by uh, others in the population as well, not just officers. So is there a way to kind of take procedural justice and apply it kind of holistically to this issue of, of bias and, and trying to prevent this outcome of, 
how many people we see unfortunately being killed or injured in these interactions. So, so in thinking about this, I, I would focus uh, on on the essence of what we talked about earlier. Uh, one is the language you use. Two is the uh, the value you place on people. I mean, I, it's kind of a, and I know it's something we've been talking about a lot lately in other contexts, but this notion of equal intrinsic value plays into uh, the approach you have to dealing with people, uh, regardless of the context of, of, of that encounter, right? So, and through that, if you, the thread of that runs through your training and it runs through, runs through what you celebrate, it runs, through, it runs through what you decide to do a debrief on, say, um, then you're in a better position, I think, to um, deal with the biases that exist uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, eradicate them in the context of the police work that needs to be done. So, if you think about running a police organization, say, there's several different ways in which you can train officers. One is, you know, of course, the standard in-service training by which you sit people in the classroom and educate them classroom style. Uh, two is you bring that to life through scenario-based training. Um, three is you combine the two when you do some scenario-based training uh, and along with uh, some classroom stuff, uh, and you, you conflate that with online learning and some small group work. And lastly, you layer on this notion of debriefing incidents by which you're dealing with folks with mental illness or any kind of a disability uh, to figure out what went well, what didn't go well. And so some of this stuff is happening. And so it's not like the stuff is either happening or not happening on sale. Um, you know, the issue of dealing with folks with mental illness uh, has been, you know, a, a, an acute issue for as long as I've been in policing, which is 25 years. And um, it has no, there's no sense that's going to be letting up soon. Uh, there simply isn't the infrastructure set, right, to, to engage folks in a different way. And these are the old folks that do health calls, right? So, um, you know, it's our job to, to deal with people that perhaps are at their worst, regardless of the reason. So, um, it, I think the, the more conscientious an organization is at thinking about the ways in which they seek to better performance, right? Uh, and define better performance as, you know, this high standard of engagement is defined by the of justice. The more they're going to sculpt and create these systems, right, to support um, bettering behavior, right? In other words, it's going to run through training. It's going to run through how we interact with folks and, and how we lead folks on, on the street. So it, it is complicated, right? So everyone, you know, is a human being, and human beings are complicated. They come to this job with the best of intentions, but they know what they know, and they've experienced what they've experienced. So it's our job in policing as police leaders to create the context for an enhanced level of understanding of human beings um, and, and the broad swath of human beings you can come across in this job. And by doing that, I, I think you're lessening probability of uh, this notion of bias coming in, especially implicit bias. Yeah, that's, that's so helpful. So it's, it's, it's kind of like creating this organizational culture that, you know, is willing to have these conversations in, in a really open way, um, but also making sure that the training is there and the training is as good as it can be. Um, and something I might add to your kind of discussion on training is um, including folks with disabilities in, in those training and having them train alongside as well. So even if you're using scenarios and things that you're also getting the disability perspective right then as officers are being trained. And then there's a secondary benefit in that officers are getting to interact with folks with dis different kinds of disabilities um, as well. And that's hopefully adding to the experience um, and their set of experiences. And, and so that could potentially lessen bias over time. And Lieutenant McGuire? Are you Lieutenant McGuire? Did you want to chime in? There you are. Oh, hold on, you're muted. Okay, say that again. No, I was saying I was having a few technical difficulties. Oh. Uh, but, but I but I think everything that's been been stated uh, is is uh, right. I believe that the key takeaway from all of this uh, is that when you look at procedural justice, it outlines uh, four pillars. Uh, and you pointed out earlier, uh, particular to people that are in crisis, right? That applies to 
to multiple situations. It applies to multiple backgrounds. I think the, the takeaway is that if we treat people with fairness and respect as we assess situations, then the outcomes are more likely uh, to be successful. Uh, we all have uh, different biases. Uh, the problem is, is that when those biases affect our decision making. And so I think that, uh, you know, echoing the chief's comments, when we can look at people uh, as people, uh, and then we can, we're, we're more likely to have a better outcome. No one's, no one's saying that police officers uh, don't make mistakes. We absolutely do make mistakes as, as people do in other segments of society in the medical field and the educational field. Uh, people make mistakes. But I think the more we can advocate and bring these uh, issues to surface, uh, the better attention people pay to them uh, and the better uh, that they are acclimated in our training environment, which will result in better decision making. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's such an important idea to see people as people, and you know, it works on both sides, right? We got to see the disability community as people, but also have to see the law enforcement community as people, and and understand that everybody in these situations is human, and, and tragedies can happen, and uh, hopefully we can work together to prevent them from happening um, in the future. So with that, I would like to turn over to um, Q and A with some of our participants. Thanks again, for both of you, for your comments on those different scenarios. I know some of them were were, were pretty tough. Um, so we have some questions lined up already, and of course, if you're if you're still with us, you're more than welcome to keep adding your questions to the Q and A box. And if we don't get to your question on the webinar today, you can send it to us via email uh, to nccjdinfo at the org, and we will um, get back to you that way as well. Um, so the first question is, is really for um, both of you, both Chief Davis and Lieutenant McGuire. Um, and someone wanted to know, what is the main goal of your respective police departments? So the main goal for each of you for, for the police departments. So um, I'll answer uh, first, and, and I'll talk about both departments I've led. So I've led uh, uh, in the public sector, uh, five years, uh, city of Brooklyn Park, about 80,000 people, 50% diverse, and I worked in the city of Minneapolis for 16 years prior to that, and the year before. So um, the main goal of the police departments that, that, that I uh, have worked for is to create the conditions um, that decrease the likelihood of crime and disorder occurring. Now, obviously, in the context of this current role, um, it's a bit of a broader definition because I, I protect students uh, anywhere in the world, right, wherever they have to be in the world. But, but the same, the same thing uh, applies, right, is, is through effective partnerships and, I, and the leveraging of ideas uh, is to create the conditions that lessen the opportunity for crime and disorder to occur. Now, to do that, you have to build trust. To do that, you have to approach people in a way that engenders a sense of communal responsibility, both inside the organization and outside the organization. So when you do that stuff effectively, um, you become effective as a police organization. So, uh, and if you do a bunch of things and do, do not change the conditions that contribute to crime and disorder, um, I, I can't see you being successful. And Lieutenant McGuire, what would you say is the main goal for the Arlington Police Department? I'm sorry. Uh, so we, we, we basically have uh, five strategic goals in our organization. Uh, but, but I'll just kind of highlight the first one, which is kind of what we've been talking about. Uh, our, our main focus uh, coming from our police chief is to build procedure justice within our organization. Uh, we know that if we treat our officers with fairness, uh, if we treat them uh, with dignity and respect, allowing our employees to have a voice, then ultimately they have a better attitude when they go out into the public and they replicate that same behavior uh, when they go out into the public. And so one of our primary goals is to build procedure justice internally uh, and we know that the end result, uh, which which we've seen in our organization, uh, that that is exercised within the public. Great, thank you so much. Um, so the next question um, is really directed towards me. Um, there's a question about characterizing the ADA as um, the medical model of disability. 
So just to clarify, the definition of disability that's used in the Americans with Disabilities Act is medical model. So the definition of disability is that there is a uh, an actual or perceived impairment that significantly limits a major life activity. So it's about an impairment. It's about what society could perceive as, as quote, wrong with the person. Um, that definition doesn't take into consideration things that society does um, to increase the impact of a disability. Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act as a whole, over time, has been interpreted in a way more consistent with the social model of disability. So it's become a tool to reduce barriers in society. Um, we talked about physical barriers a bit, um, increasing access to buildings, those kinds of things. And we also see parts of the law and the regulations now that go into decreasing um, other kinds of barriers, communication barriers, all these other kinds of things um, that you know we didn't necessarily see it at the beginning. So the definition, just to clarify, is medical model, but when we look at the Americans with Disabilities Act as a whole, yes, it's very much becoming this tool to, um, to address the social model of disability and um, the different barriers that society has created that in can, can increase those disabilities. So thank you so much for that question. I'm glad I had a chance to clarify that. Okay, so the next question is um, for both of you. Uh, do either of your jurisdictions have a special docket for courts, or it sounds like maybe a specialized court for individuals with developmental disabilities? And if so, do you know whether it's been helpful in dealing with suspects or defendants who have intellectual or developmental disabilities? So, go ahead, Lieutenant Hoy. Sure, I, I'm, I'm, I can't answer that question 100% uh, for sure. Uh, I know that uh, within Arlington is located within Tarrant County. Uh, I know that there are multiple partnerships uh, concerning persons with intellectual disabilities uh, that we try to accommodate uh, even in our uh, arresting process or, or prosecution process. Uh, I think the thought process is, is how do we address uh, criminal behavior uh, outside of someone that needs some type of assistance, uh, whether it's some type of treatment or whether it's some type of uh, special help to try to get them the tools to be successful. So uh, when it comes to uh, that thought process, I know that, that as a supervisory team and working with the district attorney's office, we try to assess those uh, thought processes uh, in trying to get those individuals help, uh, regardless if they committed some type of crime. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, longer down the line through the prosecutorial process, I'm, I'm unsure. And uh, Chief Davis, are you aware of any specialty courts um, uh, in Boston or in Massachusetts? No, not not specifically designed to deal with uh, people with disabilities or mental illness. So, I mean, I, I think what was just stated um, is, is – uh, kind of a common practice, right? Kind of vetting through things pre-court uh, to, to see if it's, you know, the criminal solution is the best one. But I'm not aware of an actual court that's dedicated to these kind of cases. And Ariel, yeah. oh, go ahead. Me, Anne. And I would just add to um, what Lieutenant McGuire was saying here in Tarrant County, I understand that they are actually looking at ways to um, get funding to create a court like that and that it can be very difficult to get that funding. So I know that's one, one issue of concern. Yeah, I think we see that kind of all over the place. Um, you know, specialty courts are, are, are gaining in popularity, but they are, you know, fairly expensive to set up and to get going in a community and then you know, there's discussions about, you know, how limited is the court? Is, is it a court for, say, someone who's convicted of a drug offense? Is it a court for someone who has a mental health disability um, or some other kinds of, of specialty courts? And I think, you know, while we're seeing more and more, there's definitely, um, I don't really know of any, <laughs> anywhere in the country for people with developmental disabilities specifically. Um, but I know there's been a lot of conversations in different places about um, either creating such a court or expanding existing mental health courts to include some other kinds of disabilities. And uh, NCCJD does have a webinar um, on this topic 
um, and a white paper. So check those out on our website if you're interested in learning more about specialty courts and some of the drawbacks and, and maybe some of the positives there um, to consider. So the next question is about um, the data I showed in Scenario C, so I might as well just click back to it. And uh, breaking down the number of individuals with psychiatric disabilities versus intellectual or developmental disabilities. So um, as Lieutenant McGuire said earlier, um, some of the media studies have indicated that about 25% or one in four of the people killed by people, I'm sorry, one in four of the people killed by police are people with psychiatric disabilities specifically. Um, then the Ruderman Foundation put together a white paper. Um, it was authored by David Perry and Lawrence Carter Long. And they looked at media studies across the board and what journalists were reporting kind of as a whole. And they came up with a broader estimate that between one third to one half of people killed by police are people with all kinds of disabilities. So um, I believe uh, psychiatric disability is included in that number, but it also includes intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, um, things like that. And if you're interested, you should definitely look up the Ruderman Foundation's white paper. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail on the different um, the different uh, incidents that have happened, the different kinds of disability, different pieces of the disability community that have been impacted, um, and there's a there's a lot of good information there. So the next question I have is about training, and the question is, is training about disability mandatory? And um, I can certainly talk about this a bit, but uh, uh, Chief Davis or Lieutenant McGuire, did you want to talk about this first? Is training mandatory um, on disability for police officers? Uh, I would say that it's specific to the, you know, it depends on what disability you're talking about. In, in some cases, in some states, um, some training, uh, for example, based on the CIT model, to deal with people with mental illness, say, is required. Um, uh, other places it's not. But yeah, I, th I think you'd be hard pressed to find not, I mean, a place where there's not some type of training. Uh, in some form of dealing with folks with disabilities. Now, obviously, it doesn't run the full gamut, right? It's not every single possible disability that exists, but I'd say the ones that uh, end, well, there's the uh, highest potentiality for lethality, say, uh, you know, an outcome, say, because of, you know, what, what could happen, the type of interactions that, that happen between police and, and, and certain. Chief Davis, we might have lost you there. Um, your video went down and we couldn't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, but maybe Lieutenant McGuire, did you want to uh, comment on the training question on whether it's mandatory? Sure. So as I was uh, talking about earlier in the state of Texas, uh, when an officer goes through the police academy, uh, they are going to go through some type of training, uh, particularly to uh, persons that, that have some type of psychiatric disability. Um, the other segments of, of the type of disability is probably not covered, uh, but that's why it's so important, as I brought forth earlier, talking about ICP's One Mind campaign, uh, where law enforcement officers have pledged to uh, uh, look at really crisis intervention training, uh, which, which really entails a lot of uh, training on persons with some type of disability. Um, our agency uh, does double what the state requires, uh, and a lot of other agencies around the country are uh, making this pledge on ICP One Mind campaign. I think it's important for people to, to realize how I many the police departments there are in the United States of America. There are 18,000 law enforcement agencies, uh, federal. Uh, local municipal police departments and tribal police departments and probably at this point approximately 900,000 police officers. So when you look at that large of a cadre, it takes time uh, uh, to train that, that, that many officers. And so that's why it has to be a part for the agency uh, to do this type of training. But I can say uh, very clearly in the state of Texas, uh, they are uh, leaning toward this type of training more frequently and more often uh, and agencies are stepping up to the plate because they know it's of great value to the organization their community. And um, 
I just want to add to that as well, Ariel, that um, we've got that we've been working at NCCJD with our funder BJA to create a an advanced course for CIT officers that is specific to intellectual developmental disabilities. So that's going to be another tool that officers can access through their the, already the traditional CIT training where that is available because it's not available everywhere throughout the country, but where they can access CIT training and for CIT officers specifically, they'll now, they will now have a course um, specifically on uh, intellectual developmental disability. So that's something that will be coming out fairly soon and will be another way to provide that training for officers. Great, thank you, Leanne. Um, and Lieutenant McGuire, yeah, you bring up such a good point that there are 18,000 different policing agencies in the United States. And so we could have as many as 18,000 different approaches to training um, on and any topic and not just on disability and of course, Every state has different rules and different requirements, but um, as Leanne mentioned, MCCJD is working to put some additional training options out there for law enforcement on this topic specifically. But yeah, at this point, in I would say in the majority of jurisdictions, training on disability is not mandatory, but um, we're seeing that, that shift a little over time and, and becoming mandatory in different states and different agencies. So the next question is for each of our panelists, um, and is what do you feel is the biggest barrier that law enforcement faces with regards to appropriately dealing with people who have disabilities? So what's the biggest barrier for law enforcement in kind of using procedural justice and interacting appropriately and respectfully with folks who have disabilities? And uh, Chief Data, so Lieutenant McGuire, I'll let you take this one first. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. All right. So. Um, I alluded to this earlier. I, I think I think it's uh, it's a leadership problem, right? So I think people come into this profession, and they have to understand exactly what the profession values, uh, and moreover, uh, what that means and manifest in every single interaction that they have, right? So it's really providing people support and a culture that uh, it really compels people to um, seek out that support within an organization to you know, have the outcomes that are desired, right? So I, I think that, you know, what we're talking about here is a, it's always a, a trifecta of issues, right? So it's, it's, it's a willingness issue, right? So we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta understand our value issue. We gotta make sure that people are valuing, um, you know, the quality of the interactions as much as they value folks that are, you know, able-bodied and don't have a, uh, any kind of limitation. Uh, it's an issue of information. Um, you know, so it's a tactically sound approach, um, and, and then and it's an issue of, of, you know, within the organization, reinforcing uh, the first two things. So we talk about, you know, changing behavior and that kind of thing. So to me, it's it's an issue of, of folks understanding you know, how to make how to ensure that best possible service is being administered and uh, creating an organization where that happens along this issue and many others like it. Thank you, Chief Davis. And Lieutenant McGuire? Yeah, so uh, two issues I'd like to, to bring up that I think uh, that kind of create barriers. Uh, Chief Davis just talked about being tactically sound. I think historically, uh, we're now in a stage where we're really uh, re-looking at use of force. Uh, and how we are engaging uh, when it comes to critical incidents. And I think one thing that's been very prevalent in the law enforcement community and conversation is, uh, is, is something intimate uh, when, when it comes to us engaging, is it an intimate threat? And so we can buy time when we look at these situations when a person is in crisis. We can kind of separate ourselves and slow the situation down. And I think we're better to uh, assess the situation for a better outcome. Uh, the second thing I, I think that is very important to talk about is this dual accountability. Um, a lot has been put up on law enforcement, a lot has been put up on the police over the last several years. Uh, and, and we've made some, some, some bad decisions and we made some good decisions. And I think it's important to understand that, that policing continues to evolve. But I think it's also important 
uh, that our community stakeholders, uh, you know, help us uh, in these situations and and take accountability, uh, uh, you know, before these critical incidents happen. Uh, so even uh, in in particular fields where this, you know, someone needs some type of psychiatric help, ensuring that they get the right medication, uh, ensuring that uh, they have uh, the right type of supervision and those things that are needed uh, in order to lessen these situations. So as I stated previously before, uh, public safety is a co-production. Uh, and so, you know, we, we realized in law enforcement that one, we can't arrest our way out of problems. Uh, two, we can't solve our problems on our own. And so it's important that, that people that are stakeholders, representatives of, of different communities step up to the plate and assist us in these matters. And I think one thing that you pointed out earlier, an uh, area that was so important, uh, is, uh, you know, having the training, uh, where, where others are involved outside of the police and community. Not even that, but just having people outside of the law enforcement community come into our institutions, come into our training environments and conduct training to give us a different assessment or a different viewpoint of what these situations are outside of how we see them. So I think that was an important point. And I would like to just add, I would like to add to that as well, because I feel like this is such an important part of this. Uh, we've talked about the in incredible importance of applying these procedural justice um, tenets to people with disabilities, but how are we going to do that, especially within our chapter network at the ARC and through other disability organizations? And one of the ways that we've been doing that is through the Pathways to Justice training where we go and create disability response teams that are made up of chapters of the ARC or Autism Society or the FASD, Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Affiliate. And you have people through with the disability community sitting down with law enforcement, with attorneys, with victim advocates in their own communities to have these discussions. Um, and they actually help us put on a training a one day training. And so that is a platform that we can use to really start those conversations before something happens. And um, it's, it's kind of a way to have a systemic way of, and a platform for being able to address this beforehand. Um, so I would, I would add to many of uh, the people on the webinar today are within our chapter network or from disability organizations um, to really look into how you can potentially establish a disability response team in your area so that you can begin to apply the things that you learned today around procedural justice um, to people with disabilities where you live. Great, thank you so much for that, Leanne. Um, you know, so I think we can see that, you know, coming together as these, as these two different communities but really starting to interact with each other, we can hopefully create better understanding and, and more goodwill and prevent a lot of these tragedies from happening. And so I just wanted to say thank you again to our panelists, uh, Chief Davis, Lieutenant McGuire, um, and Lieutenant Daniels, who had to jump off. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. Um, if we didn't get to your question, um, you can, of course, email us at that email address, info at the arc.org um, or follow us up with us directly. If you are interested in learning more about the different training opportunities that NCCJD offers, also go ahead and e email that um, address and we can follow up with you about that. And uh, don't forget there will be a short um, survey that pops up after the webinar is over. If you could just take five minutes to fill that out, it really helps us out and make sure that we're bringing you um, webinars that are on the, on the latest topics in criminal justice and disability. So thank you so much again to everyone and to our audience for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and, and energy on this. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>